Well, I'm here today with Othney Lathan from Legislative Services Agency, and we're going to go through a couple of these amendments. The first one is the one about organizing the 1901 Constitution, and there's getting a lot of buzz about this. A lot of people are kind of freaked out about this. Um, I was on the Constitution Revision Com Commission back in 2010. I kind of feel like as a watchdog to make sure craziness wasn't happening. Um, so I, I understand the feelings of not wanting to change the great things that are in our constitution. But, and I would like to put this to an arrest and let people keep their grubby hands off of our constitution. We want to seal it and make it secure, but we do have some issues with it. So Othney, what to explain where we are in this process and why the voters need to vote on this. Sure, so Becky, thanks for having me, number one. Um, number two, we work together on that effort, so I hope you know how we work and we try to be as transparent as is possible. Um, so, so as you know, over the years, there's been a lot of changes to our Constitution. Amendments um, have, and things correct. like that. Oh, 978. Way, our Constitution is this big. It's the world's largest Constitution. And that's just the statewide provisions. There's a whole other volume with almost 750 local amendments. Okay? so. Um, and I'm glad you showed that book, Becky, because it's going to be important to the conversation we're about to have. So as of May, the May primary, we have 978 amendments to the Constitution. Those amendments in their official form stack on top of the almost 300 sections of the 1901 Constitution. So the official version of the Constitution, what the voters have voted on is those discrete 978 amendments on top of the almost 300 sections. So you may remember, Becky, as part of the Constitutional Revision Commission work, we rewrote, I think it's four articles of the Constitution, and we replaced those whole four articles. However, in the official version, we didn't actually replace those four articles. We added an amendment that supersedes those four articles. So to give you an example, in 2012, the voters ratified a rewrite of the corporate article, which you were involved with. Nothing nefarious, we rewrote the co corporate article, took out how banks were regulated in 1901, made it current with today's banking practices. All of Article 12 was repealed and replaced, but the only way you know that in the official constitution is by finding Amendment 872. So a citizen who wants to know what's in our constitution about banking would have to read the constitution and then have the perseverance to make it to Amendment 872 to know, hey, all of that was repealed and replaced by this language in 2012. OK, so that's the official way things work. Now, the book you just held up is the equivalent of volume one of the Code of Alabama, which is this book. That's not the official constitution. That's a recompilation that was authorized by an act of the legislature in 2003 that gave the code commissioner of the state of Alabama, who at the time was Jerry Bassett, it's the position I now hold today, the right to officially right it says official but it's not it's really not it's not official because the voters didn't vote on it never ratified it right so this document has never been ratified even though however, it says official even though it says official however lawyers the select citizens that are well informed like you who've bought a version of the recompiled have a shortcut to the rest of the state in that they have an official but never ratified hey, here's where it would actually go. Here's how it makes sense in context right. to those 978 amendments. So the first thing we wanted to do was create an opportunity for the voters to actually ratify this. Okay, We've been make, living it with it. Make, it make it official. Make it really official, yes. We've been living with it for 20 years. The Alabama Supreme Court uses it. Lawyers use it. Again, you know, well-informed citizens know about it and use it but the ordinary citizen doesn't. 
and no one's ever had the right to vote on it. And, and so what we did was in 2019, there was a bill sponsored by Marika Coleman. Um, that same bill, Becky, or a very similar version of it had been introduced three or four years in a row before that by Del Marsh in the Senate. Um, but the legislature just wasn't ready for it, right? It mm -hmm. takes, you know, people couldn't get comfortable with the process. And then in 2019, it kind of got legs of its own. And what that turned into was Amendment 951. Right. And the voters voted and ratified Amendment 951 in 2020. And 951 said the director of LSA could bring forward a one-time proposal in 2022 that the legislature could consider would have to pass by a three-fifths vote and go to ratification in the fall. And it could do four things. It could recompile the Constitution striking those provisions that had been repealed by previous amendments, inserting that language that had been added, could remove racist language, could consolidate economic development provisions, and could organize the local amendments in a way that makes sense. Those four things. And then it said, and do make no other changes. Correct. Okay. So, and, and we took that make no other changes very seriously. So, 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 the legislature, after that was ratified in 2020, in 2021, they passed a resolution creating an advisory committee to make to help me in making the recommendation of what the legislature would consider. That advisory committee had 10 people on it. It had three members of the House, Marika Coleman, Danny Garrett, and Ben Robbins. Three members of the Senate, which were Roger Smitherman, Arthur Orr, and Sam Gavan. It had four lawyers from outside the legislative process. Stan Gregory, who you probably know, constitutional scholar in Montgomery. Greg Buttress, who served on the previous Constitutional Revision Commission with you. Al Vance, who's a lawyer in Birmingham. At the time, he was Assistant General Counsel of Alltech. Um, he's now gone into private practice as a mediator. Um, and Anita Archie, who works for Alabama Power, um, used to be a, a, a two-year college president, has a lot of experience in economic development. Um, that committee, the first thing that committee decided was let's not try to recompile from scratch. Let's start with the draft that everybody's had for 20 years. Okay. 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 That's so good to know. So we are not going back to the very 1901. We're doing this thing that was not, not really official. It says official. We've been kind using of. it, but... It, so, no, so, no one so, ever voted on it, but this is what right. everyone uses. Okay. Right, but this is what everyone will use is. Okay. With a caveat, and this takes care of about 10 things that are on your chart, 10 or 12 things. When the Code Kiss Commissioner prepared this, he made some editorial changes to correct some obvious spelling and grammar issues, right? And I'm going to yeah. share my screen for a second, okay. Becky, if that's okay. Hopefully, I'm going to share the right one. So this is Amendment 909 that was ratified in 2016. And if you look at this last phrase or sentence, it says, nothing herein shall authorize a county commission to supersede, amend, or repel an existing local law. Now, I'm embarrassed, right? I wasn't in charge of this office at the time it happened, but you know how the legislative process works. Unfortunately, the legislature passed and the people ratified a constitutional amendment with the word repel when it very clearly should have been repealed. I think we all would agree it should have been repealed. Yes. However, the people ratified repel. Now, in this version of that, and this is on Westlaw, which has this is the official publisher, and, and you know, this is on Westlaw, you will see repel has been taken out, and in brackets it says repeal. Okay. Okay. That's really what they meant. It was just That's really what they meant. But the people didn't vote on the word repeal. They voted on the word repel. So when we started this process, we said, we're going to start with this book, but we're going to take those, we're going to take those editorial changes that were made and never voted on back to the original. Because unfortunately, 951 says, and make no other changes. Right. And we wanted to take the absolute conservative be completely have complete fidelity to what the people ratified the process to be so we're putting the typo back in right and there's 12 instances on that chart that i think you've circulated to your membership it's available on our website 
um, there's 12 instances where there were typos that were corrected in this book from what was repealed, what was ratified in the original language, and we're putting the typos back in. Now, so eventually, they, yeah. maybe we can bring an amendment to correct those things. But we didn't believe 851 gave us that power, so we weren't. 951. Really, 951, right. I'm sorry, yeah. yes. Nine, okay. We didn't believe 951 gave us that power, so we didn't do it. Okay, can you stop sharing your screen for just a minute? Yes. Um, so we have here this little chart that talks about the things that we're gonna change. And they, these are the grammatical errors. And we're have, so the, the voters never got a chance to vote on those. So now we're giving them the chance to vote on the original. Correct, so we're not including language. those changes, we're putting the original language back in. So that chart has 15 changes and those 15 changes are the only changes to text from the 122 years of ratified opportunities that are being made in this whole constitution. Every other change is taking out the repealed versions of the banking article and putting in the banking article that your task force put together, right? Those things which were all ratified. Every other change is organizational. The only textual changes are 15 instances and 12 of those are putting typos back in because that's what the people ratified. Okay. That okay. makes a lot of sense. And I know it's way in the weeds for most people. They just want to know, do I vote yes or no? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it, I think this is this is a really good point that you're saying. There are no substantive, substantive changes. Substantive changes Thank you. at right. all. We're just reorganizing it, making it make sense, taking out the duplicative stuff that's in there that has already been repealed. And Okay. So Becky, our book will look be smaller at the it end. It will. It will. It will be. It will be somewhat smaller. Um, Becky, the truth is, the law of the state the day before ratification and the law of the state the day after, if this is ratified, will continue to be one hundred percent identical, right? Okay. Because those those twelve typographical errors, the courts will live with them. They'll know we meant repel and that we're not trying or, or repeal that we're not trying to repel something. Right. That will all work. And the only other three changes we're making to the text of our Constitution are the removal of three pro pro provisions that that 10 person task force agreed were racist language. And we'll talk okay. about those in a minute. OK. Right. But that's the only changes we're making. And all three of those provisions are already an operative under federal law. Right. So let's talk about those. Okay. And let's go from the easiest to the hardest. Let's go in okay. reverse order, right? Okay. So let's talk about section 259 first, the poll tax provision. So 250, 259 is already an operative because after the Voting Rights Act was passed, the United States Supreme Court said it is illegal to collect a poll tax, right? So we haven't collected a poll tax for decades. In fact, Previously, in 1996, the voters in the rewriting of the suffrage article took out all the other poll tax provisions except this one because it was in the education article and we didn't cross over articles in, in our amendments after that 1983 court case. Okay. Right. So Section 259 should be completely non-controversial. We're taking out the provision that says if a poll tax is collected, the money stays in the county where it was collected. Okay. We can't collect a poll tax. There is no poll tax. That language is dead. It's coming out. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Next one. The next one above it is section 256. Okay. Now, this one is one that you know from your history and, and, and you know, around the same time as that test, as the previous Constitutional Revision Commission, this is the, this is the one that has failed twice. The rewrites of section 256 failed in 2004 and it failed in 2012. Um, I, I think based on lack of education in both instances, not nefarious reasons, but this is our segregated school provision. Okay. okay. And there are two changes, two changes coming out in this. It looks like three on this block, but that's because the comma is on the front end of language that's being pulled out. Okay. Right. So it's really two changes. And we're removing. The last phrase um, 
the last phrase of the first paragraph, which says, in furthering or proceedings for education to require or impose conditions or procedures deemed necessary for the preservation of peace and order. Now, some people don't see that as racist, right? That phrase doesn't mention race, so I understand that argument. However, that language was added following the Brown versus Board of Education decision in the 1950s, and it was specifically added so that the state would have an argument that it could continue having segregated schools, not because of race, but because of security and the need to maintain peace. Mm. Okay? So that's why that phrase is considered racist language. That's why the committee felt comfortable that that felt within the mandate of Amendment 951 and needed to come out. Okay. Okay? The second change is the removal of the whole third paragraph of 256. And that paragraph, and I'll read it to you, in order to, con to avoid confusion and disorder and to promote the effective and economical planning for education, the legislature may authorize the parents or guardians of minors who desire that such minors attend schools provided for by their own race to make that election. And it goes on from there. So a clear segregation provision. Okay. And okay. that's completely out now. And that's now completely out. That paragraph comes out. Okay. So that's the second. So that takes care of 259 and 256 and explaining what's going on. The third is at the, towards the top of your chart at section 32. And this yes. is the one that I think there's the most confusion about. Okay. Yes, right here. And involuntary section, servitude. Involuntary servitude. Okay. And, and this provision admittedly tracks the language of the 13th Amendment to the federal constitution. Okay. And, 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 and is, you know, there are 19 states that still have this similar provision. And there's a chart on our website, Becky, that you can look at and others can look at that gives a history of this language in other states. OK. OK. And this is what specifically allowed for what is known as the convict leasing program that existed in Alabama in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And, and we had a whole presentation and a memos on our website from Archives and History about how that was a practice that was exceedingly disproportionate in its effect on African-Americans. Um, I think in most years, the data on that memo showed that it was 90 percent of the convict leasing program was African-Americans mm -hmm. who were convicted and leased out as labor. That practice ended in the 1920s. We no longer have any provision where prisoners, convicts, inmates do anything that a court has interpreted as involuntary servitude. Correct. Right? And Which we can is, this allow. This is a sticking point for people right here. Pay attention to this because you look at it, you look at this, and you think, well, this, oh my gosh, now our inmates are not going to be able to do, we can't make them do work anymore. Correct. And, that's and I not think true. that's what everyone is thinking. That's right. And that's not true. There is a very large body of law, federal law, that lays out what things you can require inmates to do as part of contributing to their care. Right. So cleaning, cooking, right. Things that in my household we call chores. Right. Right. Um, and those are wholly allowed and they're not dependent upon the ability to call them indentured servitude. Right. It's it's just normal activity that the courts have said, yes, you can require inmates to participate in this normal activity. Secondly, there is a pro there is law well developed that talks about how you can have prison industries. And maybe that's prisoners who make furniture like we have in Alabama that are sold through the you know Department of Corrections to state entities. I think the desk I'm using in my office was built by by inmates. The chamber of the Alabama Senate is beautiful. And all of that furniture was built by inmates. Those inmates are paid, but they're paid less than minimum wage because for two reasons. One, they are learning a skill and improving skills for when, you know, they reenter society. They've been they've been taught a trade or a skill. Um, and secondly, the idea is to make those, you know, the goods that prisoners are making marketable. Mm -hmm. By them, by, by being able to use labor that is less expensive than ordinary labor, right? right? And that's but it's all certainly allowable. not indentured servitude. It is not indentured servitude. 
And the courts have consistently held, whether you're in a state that has the indentured servitude like Alabama currently does, or one of the majority of states that does not, you can have inmate programs that do that. Now, what's unfortunate, unfortunate for us, is that not every state is the same, right? So there've been a lot of newspaper articles about, you know, there are several states looking at removing this language. In some of those states, that is problematic. California, for example, their governor blocked an attempt to vote to remove involuntary servitude, even though that governor is on the opposite end of the spectrum of, the, of, of your group, right? Mm -hmm. And he did that because California has a very aggressive minimum wage law. And he was concerned that if they didn't amend their minimum wage law first, that they would be required to be paying inmates $15 an hour to if they crash, repeal, or... right. Whatever. And so, so, so it, that situation is very different, right? It's a very different situation than Alabama. We don't have a state minimum wage law. We don't have a state law that might be read by a federal court to say, you've gotten rid of this convict labor scheme. You now have to pay some prevailing wage that you've chosen to put into law in your state, right? So, so I'm not saying, I'm not speaking for any state other than Alabama. But in Alabama, we are very confident that removing this language will have no effect on our correction system, will have no effect on those things that inmates do to help run the prisons they're in and have no effect on those various prison industries that are coming forward. Now, listen, that doesn't mean somebody may not file a lawsuit, right? I mean, you know, in today's, you in today's, I mean, right, in today's world, people file lawsuits. What it does mean is that we're very confident they would not file a successful lawsuit. Okay. That was there one more um, on the racist. That's it. Those racist. are the only three racist okay. provision okay. changes. So, so if you don't I, mind, let me just give you one more piece of information because I think it's helpful. Um, that's all we've done on the statewide provisions. The other thing this does is cover those 750 local provisions. And right now, you know, you just have to look through them and try to figure out. We, we are proposing, and, and if ratified, the Constitution would now have a separate volume of local provisions broken up by county mm -hmm. and then with a consistent numbering system within each county. So in other words, if, if, the, county, if, if the county has passed a constitutional amendment dealing with court, the court system in that county, court costs, for instance, it will always be in the Amendment 2 section within each of the 67 counties. And if that amendment two section is blank in a county, that means they haven't passed one. So, so it is a consistent numbering and organization system that will bring much more transparency for people to know what individual constitutional amendments have been passed for their county or their city. Okay. I think this really does make a lot of sense. And would you agree that one of the reasons they say we need to have a big constitutional rewrite is because of the racist language, because it's not in order. They keep using all of the, the things that this fixes will now be taken away as an argument to rewrite our constitution. We can finally lay it to yes. rest that our yes. constitution is intact. It is a great constitution and Right. I mean, that happy. debate won't go away. <laughs> right. That debate won't go away. But yeah. the most glaring examples that are impossible to argue with go away. Right. I mean, we will have at that point removed racist language. Right. Another another example of why recompiling matters, Becky, is along those same lines. Section 102 of our Constitution is what prohibited interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. Right. We as a people voted to repeal that provision in 2000 but it's amendment 667. So in the official constitution, it's still there in 102 and you have to make it to amendment 667 to know we've repealed it. Okay. It goes away entirely with this recompilation because the people have already voted to take it away. We just haven't been able to effectuate their will in total because we haven't had the ability to actually vote on a recompilation until now. Okay, okay, it makes sense now. It's very important when people vote yes on this, which this isn't even amendment. This is not an amendment. This is called on the ballot. What does it say? The 2022 recompilation. That's right. Constitution of Alabama of, of 2022. Okay. So it if you comes vote between the last candidate 
and Amendment 1. Yeah, it's a tricky, it's a you have to look for it. It's on that first page before you get to the amendment. So you vote yes on that. The Now, it's this is important, you vote yes on this, but there's an amendment that kind of goes along with this. So tell us about that. The other yes. thing we need to vote yes on if is... If you are a yes on the recompilation, you definitely want to be a yes on Amendment 10. And Amendment 10 does two things. Um, the first thing is there are 27 amendments up for ratification simultaneously with this recompilation. 10 of them statewide, 17 of them local amendments. So the first thing it does is say those 27, whichever ones of them get ratified, will get folded in where they belong in this recompilation so that we don't start this whole nonsense again on day one. Okay, if so we have a new so constitution, let's have a new constitution not a new constitution with 27 amendments. Okay. And it, it doesn't give us the authority to change any words in them, make any language changes. It just gives us the authority to put them where they belong in this, in this, you know, structure that we've okay. created. Makes sense. And then the second thing, which is, is maybe even more important than that is that, you know, these provisions have 120 years worth of judicial decisions that go along with them, you know, where the court has interpreted what does this tax mean? What does this provision limiting local government mean? And, and, and the second thing Amendment 10 does is it says for any provision where the language is unchanged and the language, remember, will be unchanged in every respect except the three racist language provisions. Right. Because we're even going back to the original typos. Right. Right. So in every provision that is unchanged, any judicial decision, any interpretation is still valid for the new constitution. Okay. And that's important because Becky, we don't want a hundred lawsuits filed the next day saying, well, in 1901, this word meant this, but in 2022, it means something different. So the law has changed. And I don't think our Supreme Court would reach that conclusion even without Amendment 2, yes. but with Amendment 10, nobody can even bring the challenge. So we okay. cut off even the expense and unnecessary hassle of even having the argument. Okay. Well, that is clear as mud. Yes. <laughs> Just kidding. No, that, that was really good. All right. Well, thank you so much. We'll see what happens on November 9th. It's, it'll be a done deal. So thank yeah. you so much for your yeah. time. Yeah. Thank you, Becky. I appreciate okay. it. Appreciate bye -bye. it. Bye-bye.